In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's Daily Memphian Tigers podcast with Greg Gaston. I hope you had a fantastic Thanksgiving. We got a different format for you this week only. Today, which is Tuesday, as we tape here at the Daily Memphian, we're talking football. Frank Bonner, Tigers football beat writer, will be joining me along with Tim Buckley, Daily Memphian deputy sports editor and senior writer. So that is dropping today. Tomorrow, we will drop our basketball podcast with Parth- with Pajai, the Tigers basketball beat writer. So separate football from basketball. Again, football today, Tuesday, basketball will be dropped on Wednesday. Frank, Tim, welcome. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving, both of you. Yeah, yeah. You know, my Thanksgiving was in Philly. So, it was with uh, me. Yeah, right. We we, we, <laughs> we broke bread together on Thursday. <laughs> and, Frank, and Frank got his cheesesteak after the game. I'm jealous that Frank had the cheesesteak. We just didn't have any time. I thought maybe for the team, since they were in Philly, after the game, there would be cheesesteaks waiting. Instead, Cane's chicken. Chicken strips. It's always chicken strips. In Philly? Yeah. That's a Southern thing. Yeah, it was Cane's. They had Cane's in Philadelphia. So, uh, hey, we all ate it. We were all hungry. But the Tigers wrap up the regular season with an easy 45-21 win over Temple. And I stress easy because they haven't been easy in Philadelphia. In fact, they've lost three straight going into that game. And they get that bugaboo off their back. They finish the regular season 9-3. and three. They finish fourth in the American Conference. They don't make it to the conference championship game. But all in all, Frank, I would have to think that you believe it was a pretty successful season. Yeah, right. And obviously there's levels to success, right? So was it the most successful season? No, but there's a lot in between success and failure. Right. And so this season is is still in the success realm, just not the most successful outcome that they were looking for. Tim, two prior seasons to this year, six and six, six and six, as Coach Ryan Silverfield told everybody, that was the basement. Uh, we we that's mediocre. That's the bottom line. We got to be better. They go out, they win nine regular season games. Now there's still Hits being thrown around at Ryan that, well, they won the nine games that they were favored in that they should have won, and they lost the three games in which they were underdogs, even though those three losses were against all teams that are ranked this week. So I'll ask you the same question. When you look back at it now, even though there's still a bowl game to be played, how would you say the season went? I'm still trying to process bugaboo. (laughs) <laughs> look it up it's in webster's i will i will google i don't think it is bugaboo um i think they met expectations they did not exceed expectations that being said expectations were high expectations were minimum nine wins they did that they did no more so you know good grade awesome grade no i mean if if they had knocked off if they had knocked out one of Tulane or SMU, both of which were winnable games. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're talking about a potential, what, 12-win season? So does a... With a conference championship game win and a a bowl win, then you're talking about incredible seasons. Okay, so, well, let me It's nice. I mean, I... I, It's it's respectable. If it's a nice bare minimum season with this year... I don't know about bare minimum. Okay, well... Bare minimum is above 500. Okay, let's look at that. The difference between the numbers, the actual wins, six last year, nine this year, but the competition, who they played on the schedule, where they played the games, who they avoided. That's the argument with people. I I, I don't buy into the argument, but their argument is, yeah, you won nine, but that equates to last year's six because you beat the teams you should have beaten. Yes, last year they lost some of those games that they should have won. This year... The games that they had to win against the teams that they were favored against, they won, albeit final minute North Texas, albeit overtime against Charlotte. To me, that's not bare minimum, but they failed in expectations of getting to the conference championship game. Do you have our contract? Because I'm pretty sure it said no math. (laughs) Nine equates to six. In some people's minds. Yeah, I I, I see what you're saying. I'm, I'm I'm on your team on that one. Right. In terms of... You know, 
people are going to complain that the people who are going to complain that nine's not good enough are the same people who are going to complain that 10's not good enough. Exactly. And and if they get to 10, it's going to be the people who complain that 11's not good enough because it should have been 12. It, it's like. And are they the true Tiger yeah, fans? Yeah, and it's like, what what can you do? Nine's a really nice season. It's an improvement on what they've done in the past. Did they upset anybody or beat anybody who you, you know, had circled as, you know, this is a tough one? No. Um, maybe that's the next step. But but if if for the true Tiger fan crowd that doesn't care the name of the coach, um, I would think they have to be pretty happy right now. Frank, what they did this year – as opposed to what they couldn't do last year, is finish. Yes, the two-lane game, they had the lead at home in the third quarter and lost that game. But for the most part, when they've trailed in games this season, they've rallied to win. And isn't that the bottom line? You can only play the teams that are on your schedule. Yeah, right. And so the the conversation behind the schedule isn't Silverfield's fault. <laughs> it isn't University of Memphis's fault. It is the, the conference that they're in. The non-conference schedule, they put Boise State on there. They put Missouri on there, right? So, um, look, the, the schedule is what it is. You, if you want to have a conversation about griping about the schedule, that's a conversation meant for the conference realignment conversation. As far as the year goes, the schedule is the schedule. Like you said, they won every game that they were supposed to. Um you would have liked to see them pull out the SMU game or the Tulane game. And so if you wanna if you wanna give them some type of knock there, you can, but to bring it all the way down as if the, this season isn't anything um to clap your hands about is going a little too far. You were at Ryan's presser after the game in Philadelphia. He had some interesting things to say. I want to get your comments on what he had to say, and then Tim can follow. Yeah, I think um I think, you know, after you you beat Temple you secure the nine and three, you know, season. I think Ryan just got some things off of his chest that he was probably holding in that he couldn't say until the the job was finished, right? And so, um, a nine like a nine and three season is a nine and three season, which is the point that he was making. I do think that as much as as Silverfield and every other coach likes to say they have the blinders on and they're focused and all that stuff may be true. But it's kind of hard to not hear or to not see the things that are being said around the program. And I think Ryan, it sounded like he was just a little fed up with it. He brought it. (laughs) He did bring it. It was almost Tommy West-esque, except it wasn't the same exact topic. He he had a targeted group of people that he was going after and bullseye. I mean, he, he, he nailed it. He nailed them. Um, you're right. It was, that was probably built up Frank, um, something he's been waiting to say for a while. I wonder if there was one or two specific things that precipitated it. If there's Mm -hmm. some out to get them camp or, or something like that, that it was directed toward that wasn't spur of the moment in my estimation, based on hearing 30 years worth of coaches talk after games. um, That was something he had been, been stewing on and he had much of the language, I think in his head long before they kicked off about, about Tim uh, against Temple. I agree wholeheartedly with both of you. I think this was stored up and he let it out. Okay. Why weren't they able to get over the hump in those three games? Now, again, for those who don't remember lost in St. Louis, which was basically a home game for Missouri by a touchdown lost that game. I alluded to just a moment ago against Tulane at home, had the lead in the second in the third quarter, had a double digit lead, lost that game. And then the big game against SMU, which could have gotten them into the conference championship game, they lose eventually by four points. What's the reason, two or three reasons, guys, that they did not get over the hump, Tim? I raised my hand first. I saw that. Turnovers, turnovers, penalties slash shooting themselves in the foot in that third game. Because the Missouri game, it was the it was the fourth quarter turnover that bit them. Uh, we, we, I asked. Uh, Seth Hennigan, this exact same question, and that was what his answer was. It was the turnovers in the first two, and then obviously there was that that little succession of the the what was it the legal man downfield the mm-hmm. the formation three uh, big penalties. on the punt and whatever that third penalty was that was just shooting themselves in the foot. Um, was that the only thing? No, but man, you eliminate that and you got a heck of a lot better chance to come out of that three game stretch. 
at a minimum one and two, if not two and one or three and oh. Yeah, and I know uh, if you talk to offensive coordinator Tim Cramsey, he was saying earlier in the year, and he he alluded to um, the Missouri Navy and I think even the Tulane game, and I know they won the Navy game, but he said there were there were specific drives in each of those games where Memphis could have put their foot on the gas and wasn't able to get over the hump on that drive to really put themselves in the best position to win. And so I do think that there were just some plays that were not made at the opportune times that Memphis just just didn't make. And when you play every game closely like they have all season, the margin of error is just so thin. At some point, it's going to bite you in the butt. And in those games, you know, they got bit. And and that's only looking at one side of the ball. The other side is the well, the, the yeah. defense out to lunch drives, um, where they had some really good defensive stands and, and defensive series. But the the one what was the one the the three passes and the short run series. I mean, they, they had it's just like that. They were, yeah they, they, they were they, in the end zone. Yeah, they had SMU. some some. Some ones where the defense just like checked out, it seemed. Yeah, and to your point about that SMU game, I mean that one, I think that was the drive that that was like, what the heck, right? Mm-hmm. Memphis scores, and then SMU, you 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 look to the left, and all of a sudden SMU's got a touchdown, and you can't have that in close games when you're trying yeah. to you're trying to win. Is that personnel or is that scheme? The defensive issues that we've seen this year is that the lack of quality defensive players. Or is it scheme or a combination of it? Because we did see it an awful lot. We also saw the defense step up. Charlotte, they had four turnovers, four interceptions, one a pick six. That helped them win that football game, come from behind and win that football game. But unfortunately, there were a lot of meltdowns with this this defense. So, Tim, is it scheme? Is it personnel? Is it a combination? What is it? I wonder if, I mean, on the back end, I think it's some combination of (laughs) – I don't know if I don't know what they're coaching them, but they're not doing what most defensive backs should do, which is hey, look back at the ball once in a while. Very rarely, very yeah. rarely did you see that. We hear the letters N I L a lot, and we hear Coach Silverfield and other coaches around the country talk about that. When you look back at this regular season with the three losses we just alluded to, and I asked you what do you think the reasons are they lost, and Tim started off by talking about turnovers and by penalties and then you mentioned the defense that they weren't consistently good unfortunately how much of a difference is it in talent from the three teams they lost to Missouri SEC Tulane right now the kings of the American and SMU we know about their NIL and they're going to the ACC do you see a big difference you know I'm not I don't so like with SMU we all know what type of NIL money SMU has, right? But as far as Tulane, I I, I don't think there's – I mean, obviously, you know, Tulane has a d- defensive line and everything. But as far as the NIL concern, I don't I don't know if Tulane has an abundance of, of, of NIL cash like SMU does. I mean, and then to the, to the point of, like, getting players, Memphis did pretty well in the transfer portal. I mean, uh, Blake Watson was a huge hit. Demir Blankamsey was a hit. Uh, Simeon Blair was a hit. And so, yes, they – Chandler Martin they got from a small school was, a, was hit, a hit, right? And so I do think the – especially in this year, the player evaluation of what they're able to get, they did a good job of getting. Obviously, they are behind in NIL, but they did a good enough job getting the talent from what that was in their grasp that I felt they could compete with what was on their schedule. I, I think your point on that – works if they just got blown out by Mizzou or by Tulane. Right. They were in it with they their talent went head to head with Mizzou's talent. And Mizzou is a dang good team mm-hmm. for for three quarters and change. I mean maybe three quarters and a penny or two, but but they they went head to head with them. They that they 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 their talent hung in with, with SEC talent for it th- minimum three quarters of a game. So that that hard, and I understand where you're coming from. And, but with it's, it. not, it's not me. You know, this is what the coaches say. Well, I don't. Maybe bigger picture, like when you when you you know evaluate what a what a program can do over mm-hmm. a five year span, and eventually mm-hmm. that catches up with you and all all that. I understand that, and I buy that. In those three games, I I didn't see that. Okay, 
We're going to talk about the transfer portal here in just a second. But now SMU is leaving this conference. And bye-bye. They're gone. But Tulane's not going anywhere. And UTSA looks like they're a strong program. And I think some of these others that are on the fringe are going to get better. Florida Atlantic, UAB, at least that's my thought. Frank, where should Memphis be next year? We don't know. We don't have all the answers. We don't know who's all leaving, what players they're bringing in. And that's the same across the board with every team. But where consistently should Memphis be? My answer every year will be that they need to be near the top. They need to be in the last two or three games or so. They need to be in contention for the conference championship, which they they were there this year. Now, every you know, so often you want to see them break through to the conference championship. But even in the years that they don't, they need to be in contention in the last handful of games every single year. Contention is pretty obvious. They should be. But actually getting to the championship game is pivotal. Do you think if next year they're in the same boat with eight wins? I Again, I haven't dissected their schedule yet. It'll be interesting to see what happens because it was advantageous for them as far as the American Conference schedule is concerned, right? We'll we'll see what happens for next year. But do you think if they win eight games, well, let's say they even win nine, but they don't make it to the conference championship game, will there be a lot of pressure on Coach Silverfield? No, the natives will be even more restless than they already are. I mean, that's you got to pop into that, you know, every so often and and just not getting there just deflates everyone. So yeah, I think I think getting to it should be the minimum expectation. Is it easier said than done? Sure. But I think you gotta start with saying it. Well and then you also have to realize that because the schedule is what it is, right? Because the conference is so top heavy, the margin for error of like I mean you look at UTSA. UTSA lost one conference game and they're not playing in the championship. I mean, the, you have to almost be perfect in this league to make the championship right. because it is so top heavy. Mm-hmm. And so you also got to like if if Memphis had UTSA's conference record where they lose one conference game at the end of the year, does that make a difference on how fans feel about the fact that they aren't in the in the in the title game? Memphis should have the you should be in the title game expectation. Well, yeah, every year. Tulane should have that same expectation. UTSA, based should. on what they've done the last five years, should have that same expectation. And there should be a minimum of one wild card expectation, like there was with who knew that James Madison was almost going to run the table in the Sun Belt. So there's four teams with expectations that two of them are going to fall short of it. So that goes to the opposite is maybe the argument of – is that too high of an expectation? Because right there, I gave you four who should have that expectation. They're not all going to get right. there. Right. Well, look, playing devil's advocate, this year was a great opportunity which with the way the schedule fell. So next year, Frank, you got to think they're going to probably play Tulane again. It'll be on the road. They may, after not having UTSA this year, probably get them next year. Who knows where that game is? Obviously, SMU's gone. But this could be a daunting conference schedule as opposed to really what it was this year. But also on the other side of that, and and this is probably from an observer perspective, I'm not saying Memphis should necessarily want this, but you want to see those top-heavy teams, Memphis, Tulane, UTSA, they should be playing each other every year. I they think. should. You, you should – because that gives you the opportunity to hand the other team a loss. Yeah. Right. And, and it's not like these are non conference games that are scheduled six years from now and you don't know whether somebody's going to be good or not. Right. You do the schedule after this year based on what happened, you know, in in the past year. Right. But you got to break through. Yeah. You have to win some of those big games. But they and don't for the last few years they haven't been able to do that. But they don't want it because they don't want to blemish their group of five record. I mean, well, yeah, that's the other <laughs> thing about because you have to get the you want that New Year's Six Bowl. You want your yeah, you don't you don't champion. want your best beating up on yeah. each other because then you don't have a chance. Oh, you think for it's anybody. a strategy for Mike Oresco? Oh, I, I definitely think not just Mike Oresco. Like every every, every commissioner league? in the conference is thinking yeah, like that because for sure. Like look at SMU's record. I mean, uh, schedule conference schedule. You you think that was by accident? They cleared a path for him. And by the way, when I say bye bye SMU, I don't mean 
good riddance. I mean, bye bye. That's how they got into the ACC. Oh, okay. It, look at they you playing yeah. on words. I didn't get yeah. that at first. Yeah, I know. I, I could tell by the look on your ah. face. <laughs> by the way, Army joins the league. I don't know if we've even touched on this. Army joins the league next year. The Army Navy game will not count as an American Conference game, which I, I don't even get it. Right. I, I don't understand the addition of Army. Does that do anything for you guys? No, I think it it, it does not, especially when the Army Navy game is not even going to be a conference game, uh, because you you say okay, you bring in Army because you already have Navy, blah blah blah, but that money is still not even of, of that game is still not even going into the conference. So it's like they don't move the they don't move the needle at all outside of the fact that Navy is also in the conference. Yeah, they don't move the needle. Except for the Army Navy game, yeah. which has nothing to, to do, do with, with the, the American conference. conference. Absolutely, it's a fun game when Navy comes to town. Maybe it'll be fun and novel when Army comes to town. But yeah, it doesn't. once in a while. But it, I, I can tell you this: but from a Mike, Mikey Stadium on the Hudson River, I've been to a game up at Army. Beautiful. I was going to say, from a location standpoint, I'm not, I'm not complaining at all that Army might be on the travel list. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's a beautiful place. Okay, we are now entering. The transfer portal time period, December 4th, official. But we're already getting words from the individuals who are taking to social media to announce. Two Carters from the University of Memphis just yesterday, meaning on Monday, uh, announcing Tevin Carter, Davian Carter, uh, Zy Brockington earlier today, Tuesday, and probably, I would say definitely more on the way. Frank, what does it all mean? I do think it's interesting this year. Remember last year, there wasn't this there what the the portal movement for Memphis didn't really start happening until after the bowl game, if you remember, right? Right. Uh people went into that bowl game thinking that Memphis kept a lot of its players and then after the bowl game it was like mad dash. Davion Carter, a starter, a starter offensive lineman, uh announcing this early, I do think is um pretty interesting compared to last year. Tevin Carter I mean, people in this camp probably want him to 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 have a shot at, at being a starting quarterback. And when you have a, a Seth Hennigan who is clearly the guy, um, you know, I guess at some point folks were going to be in his ear telling him that he should probably look at other options. You know, you, you know what I I don't think is fair is like I don't have much respect for these kids who opt out of the bowl game because they want to protect their. NFL draft chances or right. whatever. Right. It's, it's just stick through the season, like be a teammate. But these kids, the Tevin Carters of the world, are put in a tough spot by ultimately by the coaches because they came up with the rules, but by the coaches in the NCAA who made it okay for there to be the early signing as soon as the first semester ends. Mm -hmm. And so kids like that have to position themselves early, and that means abandoning their team and not sticking with the team through the bowl game. Like, I respect the the coordinators who know they're going to be a head coach somewhere else, but they say, you know what, I'm going to stay with my team and I'm going to coach the bowl game, and if i got to do two jobs at the same time, whatever, and everybody works it out. But it's not the fault of these kids that that they're having to, to do it, whether it's to position yourself for a starting job because schools want to know who they're going to have sooner than later. They don't want to have to wait until January to decide exactly. who's who they're going to bring in to compete for a starting quarterback job. And in the case of, of the other Carter, it's just speculation, I suppose, but, and we probably shouldn't do that, but I'll do it anyway. It, they're dangling money in front of the kid or in front of kids who have a chance to go to SEC programs, NIL money, why wouldn't he pull the trigger? It's not the kid's fault for for the ones in that position. Yeah, let me let me, let me let me piggyback on that. And and Frank, I'll get your, your thoughts, but I, I don't want to forget to say this. I I do believe it was a colossal mistake in adding the early signing period, and that was pre NIL slash transfer portal. Now it's even worse. The, that had what's going. They need to go back. They the, need to get rid of anything that's happening in December portal wise. Signing wise, with high school and junior colleges, move it all to after the first of January. The coaches wanted it; they lobbied for it hard. They got it, and as soon as they got it, they realized all the problems. Exactly. With it. Well, and the, 
the early signing period. There, there is no early signing period. The early signing period is the is there's a signing period and a late signing period, right? Now. Like because the early yeah, signing period December. has to turned into the signing, but it never period. was. It was it always the first was, week right. in February. Um, but to your point about the doing this before the bowl game, I also think that there is a there is a, a conversation in in the fact that if I know I'm not going to be with this team, you know, after this season. Football is a physical sport. I'm not going to put my my body in harm's way when I know I'm looking elsewhere already. And so I do think that's also part of it. Not necessarily for like a backup like Tevin Carter, but, you know, an offensive lineman, defensive lineman, or who, or whoever, um, you, you, you have to think about that also. Then you shouldn't play. Which they didn't. No, then you shouldn't play from the start of the season. You stick well, with your team to the end of the season. You didn't know at the start of the season that you were going to transfer. Don't play. So you have no, an I mean, issue. You have an issue with with anybody. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I, I'm a believer in seeing things through. Again, like, like Caleb Williams, if he if he opts out of their bowl game, USC had a disappointing season. Yeah. They're not they're not in the playoffs. If he decides, that would be nonsense. So if he decides yeah. he's not going to play, yeah. you know, he's probably going to be the first overall pick or at least yeah. way up there. You think that's yeah? Bad. I, the, what you're saying, Frank, the protect yourself argument, I don't buy into as much as the I'm doing it because. I know I have to go somewhere else. And they put me in the position of having to pull the trigger early. It's not something I wanted to do. It's forced on me argument. Mm-hmm. Rebuttal? I mean, I, I mean, I think it, it goes it's, – it's all situational, right? I mean, I don't think there's a, a broad stroke – of, That's of, fair. I agree. Yeah. Right. Every every athlete situation is different in terms of why they may choose to play or not play or, or or whatever the case may be. Like the Caleb Williams situation, and you play that game, right? I mean, you. I, I agree that Caleb Williams, you know, should play that game. But if he if he chooses to opt out, I, I don't really know if you can crucify the guy for for opting out. I mean, like you can yeah. you can I'm argue not both go ways, path yeah, and, and, because the, it. it it makes sense why he would opt out if he's already thinking about the next, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's just – that's what college football has become. It has. It's – and it's not good. It's it's not good. All right, two more topics real quick. Number one, Ryan Silverfield, interesting. His name came out on a list for Indiana with about 12 other names as Tom Allen was let go. This is the first I have seen – of a list and since Ryan Silverfield's been at Memphis that his name has popped up on a list for another school. I don't know how serious, I don't know what it all means. Obviously the school, meaning the university of Memphis has to figure out what they're doing as far as more than likely an extension, Frank, I'm not sure if he'll get a pay raise. So that's just another little, you know, a little caveat into the whole mix here. Yeah. And the question is, do you ask, does it, does it matter how serious or not serious it is? if you are in negotiations, right? And so if his name is included enough on whatever list or whatever, if that gets enough traction, and by enough traction, I mean just a little bit, is that enough to negotiate more money or or longer extension or whatever with Memphis if his name is being thrown out about a job in any capacity? Depends it's, on how much they want him, right? Yeah. They want to I retain mean, him. I mean – the haters would say that that's an ideal scenario. Mm-hmm. And um, some have. Yeah. It, it, but, I mean, but athletic directors, most of them do know and they should know, is this a negotiating ploy that the agent's throwing the right. name out or or are they in serious talks with the guy and he's in their final three or their final two and we, we really want to keep them and what what can we do to to do that? And, I mean, as to whether or not it's legit – I mean, Mr. IU over there, he's the one who should know. Oh, I'm, I, yeah, I'm definitely going to try. To. I mean, he's, he's like, you expect him to have all that. Oh, he's, like, he's IU Indiana. royalty. He's, he's like, well, I don't know about all of that. Oh, yeah. No, he's the, <laughs> he's up there, Bob Knight. He's, he's up there he's with got the Isaiah Thomas, next to Bobby Knight, Mark huh? Cuban. Yeah. He's, he's even Lee Majors. Do you know Lee Majors was an IU grad? I do not. Yeah. I do not. Do you know who Lee Majors is? I know the name, but I, I don't. figured he would not. <laughs> I'm about to say I, I've heard the name. Explain but. yourself, Tim. Google it, Frank. For our listeners, Google who don't it. Know. Google it, listeners. Man, you want them to do some homework? Okay, we will find out on Sunday where the Tigers are going bowling. Going bowling for a tenth straight year. Something you don't want to take too lightly. Although some fans have, ah, oh, it's a bowl game. Who cares? It's a bowl game for ten straight years. That's an accomplishment. But it could be the AutoZone Liberty Bowl game. 
It could be Fenway. It could be the Military Bowl. That's the names we're hearing. Frank, what are you hearing? What do you expect to, to be announced on Sunday? Um, I do expect uh, the Liberty Bowl to to grab Memphis um, just because how things are, are shaking up. Um, if I had to guess, like if I had to do a projection, my projection would be the Liberty Bowl just because if if you're going down the path of the SEC having to choose which bowl not to grab, it looks like it, it would likely be the Liberty Bowl. And if the Liberty Bowl is the one that has to choose an American team, why would you not pick Memphis from a ticket sales standpoint? Right. SMU makes a lot of sense if they lose the Tulane because they're the runner-up. But from a ticket sales standpoint, and it's all about the bottom line, Memphis makes a lot of sense. Now, Tim, you didn't play big-time college football. I didn't play big-time college football, but I can tell you this. If you ask me my choice of, of a bowl game and they're not asking the players, and it would be somewhere or at home, I would pick somewhere. Yes. yes. I don't care where that somewhere is. But they're not taking the players' thoughts and, and, and feelings into consideration. No, it's, they rarely do. Right. If I'm one of those kids, I'm ticked. I went and helped, helped you win nine games. My reward is staying at the Embassy Sweet Sun Union. Like, uh, it's that. Going to the Bass Pro Shop. Yeah. The only exception, not the only exception, one of the exceptions to that rule is, you know, in the old days, if, if you're USC and you want to stay at home playing the Rose Bowl. Yeah. You know, that, that kind of thing. Right. But but for this, I understand why the bowl wants to do it, ticket sales. I understand why the kids would be frustrated. They're not getting to go somewhere fun or cool. Um, and But the other factor is local economy. I mean, the business people, the hotels, the restaurants, they're losing on the whole crowd that's coming from out of town that's going to stay here for three nights or four nights or a long weekend Good or point. whatever and spend money on food and lodging and and all of the rental cars and all that stuff. But the Liberty Bowl, like, that's not their concern. Like, no. So, like, but, that. But you still got to be a a, 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 a citizen. <laughs> a, a, a local citizen is a, is a, from a business standpoint. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, if, 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 if you're the, if you're the Liberty Bowl, do you care about the hotels being able to get their money or do you care about you being able to get your money in ticket sales? Like, which one do you value oh, more? Oh, I know. I understand. Well, a lot of them are sponsors of the game, so I'm sure they care. But you're right. The bottom line is still they want to make sure that it benefits them. But what are we talking about here? Is Memphis all of a sudden, other than what the visiting team brings, which won't be a ton of people, more than likely it's going to be, what, Kansas State or Iowa State, somebody from – Obviously, the Big 12, that's the contract. And if it's not an SEC team, then we're talking about Memphis or or SMU, more than likely from the American. But you know, what, are, what are we talking about here? The Tigers are all of a sudden there's going to be 60,000 Tigers fans at the game? That ain't happening. Well, no. Um, I mean. They barely got 30 for SMU, which I thought was a disappointment. Right. But barely getting 30 for SMU, they may get 26, 27, you know, or, or, or 30, whatever, coming to, to the Liberty Bowl. How many? How many do you think that SMU is going to bring, or, or whatever? Do you think SMU's traveling is going? No, to no, 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 be no. They more don't. Than, that, that's to your point. Yeah, yeah, it benefits the Liberty Bowl. But what I'm saying is, twenty seven thousand sounds like a lot from one school, which which it is. But you're talking about probably thirty something thousand people in the stadium. They're used to getting fifty thousand people when it's an SEC team playing yeah, a Big Twelve. Yeah, They're yeah. used to getting that many. Our, Arkansas and Kansas, they. They drew well they last bring a year. Lot they of people. announced over fifty, and that was probably pretty legit. To right, them. right. Well, the the Memphis Iowa State game, um, twenty seventeen didn't do, do didn't no, do that. but I, I think mean, they was, were they were fired up about that, weren't they? They were fired up. To I mean, I wasn't the here, so I, I, that was I think that a was different a different feeling. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 absolutely. And Iowa State did did draw it did bring a lot of people, but. Certainly not twenty five, thirty thousand people. But I do think it, it becomes more important who the Big Twelve team is. Which Big Twelve team do you yeah, think is going to travel is, more this? in terms of fans? Yeah. Right, like because now you have to try to get as many fans out of that Big Twelve team exactly coming to 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 the Liberty Bowl. And and the final point here, and we'll wrap things up, is from a Memphis standpoint. You're going to get a bigger piece of the total pie because all the bowl participants, all that money goes into the the one coffer of the SC, of the American Conference, and they divvy it up. But if you are, for example, Tulane, you play in the Fiesta Bowl, 
That's $8 million they're throwing in the pot. You're going to get a bigger chunk. Memphis plays in the Autos and Liberty Bowl. It's a bigger payout than the military and a couple of these other bowls that they're associated with. So you'll get a little bit more money. You don't get all that money. For those who think they get all that money, they don't. The other thing is you get a chance to play a Big 12 team if you're Memphis. You get a chance to play a Power 5 school, and if you can get that win, you've beaten a Power 5 school, you finished with 10 wins for just the fourth time in the history of the program. That's 108 years. That's a feather in Ryan's cap. That's a feather in those players' cap. Tim, no? Yeah, but in the fans' eyes, I don't know if it moves the who cares needle. No, you're right. The fans. But in that locker sir- room, though, I do think it – like if you're talking about getting up for the game, okay, if you're if you're not getting up for the location because you're still at home in Memphis, you might get up for the fact that – um you hear everybody talking about the fact that you haven't beat anybody. You lost to Missouri. You lost to SMU. You lost to Tulane. And you get this Big 12 team basically coming in your home stadium. Mm-hmm. And you get another crack at ending the year beating a Power 5 team. I think that locker room, yeah. you don't think those uh, the coaches in that locker room are going to play that up if that's what happens? There'll be more interest. There'll yeah. be more interest in that game than there would be in the, in the military bowl or – Probably even the Fenway. I don't even know who's affiliated with those bowls, but I think there would be if I'm a, if I'm absolutely a, if more. If I'm a kid, I, I want to go play Fenway. That would be. That'd be I still cool. would want to be on the road. I absolutely would, but we don't As have a sports writer. I want to go to the Pop Tart yeah. Bowl. Yeah, we you. don't have a dog in that fight. All right. Go to Boston or Annapolis or something. I'm, I'd be down for that. We'll know Sunday. We'll talk about it next week. Frank, thank you so much. Uh, always, always a good time chatting with you. Tim, good stuff. Appreciate you got it, it Greg. All right, that'll do it for this week in our Daily Memphian Tigers podcast. Again, we've broken up football and basketball, so check out both. And also be sure to check out our other podcast, the Daily Memphians Food Podcast, Sound Bites. It's hosted by Chris Harrington and Holly Whitfield. The Sidebar with Eric Barnes is about arts, culture, and everything in between. And the Grizzlies Podcast is also hosted by Chris Harrington with Drew Hill. All of our podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts. Take care, everybody.